Hello everyone and welcome to another Scots Way Hay, very special Scots Way Hay, although they are, they're all special. Um, this is an intro I'm recording that Scots Way Hay Towers were in. Um, the reason being uh, the podcast you're about to hear is an interview with Alistair Gray, which I recorded um, at his house, ostensibly to talk about his latest book of Me and Others, um, and also the interview forms a basis of an article for the National Library of Scotland magazine, should they choose to run it, indeed. Um, the sound, what do you think, Ian? It's not perfect, but... No, it's not quite the, the crystal quality that we have. That we normally in have your, when Ian is... In a kitchen. It, it's, <laughs> a, it's another example of why Ian is vital to this whole <laughs> uh, undertaking. But, um, yeah, I, I recorded it with him, and uh, I think it's listenable. Which we've uh, we had to fix some volume issues. Alistair tends to. Um, he's the Mogwai of interviewees. He goes quiet, quiet, loud, quite a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a performance. It's definitely. a performance. It's fantastic. He's all as as with everything with Alistair. It's a fantastic um, performance. Very interesting listen as he touches on childhood reading, um, the importance of a uh, libraries. Funnily enough, in, in his uh, early life and continued life. Um, but then he, as you would expect, he goes off on lots of tangents and interesting detours. Uh, it was fantastic uh, spending the time with him, talking to him about it. Uh, we recorded it before we had the launch of the book uh, down at Mono, and uh, he was in very good form. So uh, I hope you enjoy it as much as uh, I did chatting to him for that time. Um, it's always interesting always controversial. It's everything you expect from Alistair Gray. Um, and here you are. Cheers. Um, obviously, Off Me and Others, your latest book has just come out and it's obviously looking on collections or back on your life in a way through uh, various essays and obituaries and a lot of non-fiction. Um, what's your feelings now that it's finished looking back on these pieces? I feel that like any big job I've ever done, I now know how to do it well if I start it all over again. <laughs> um, it omits, I was going to say, it omits too much. I meant it just be a, to be a collection of all my essays that I thought made sense mm -hmm. uh, from one I wrote when I was 17 up till some I wrote this year, uh, one I wrote this year, I had not thought they would tell a story as a sequence. Mm -hmm. I was surprised when near the end I realised it did tell a kind of story, partly an intellectual autobiography, not an emotional autobiography because I didn't go into my sex adventures <laughs> and that, uh, no, um, but, but uh, I realised it was a social autobiography because taken in sequence they announced somebody who took, who assumed that the United States of Britain um, was permanent. And because it had achieved the welfare state, which had educated me so well, and also it showed me growing up in a Glasgow that was still a hugely exporting, productive place of ships and machinery and textiles, comma, in other words, a place, 
important in the world. But the queer thing was, though Glasgow was commercially and industrially an important part of the world, in the 1950s and early 60s, the Scots, most Scots, had lost any faith in their own importance as poets and writers and thinkers and philosophers, and there was Hugh McDermott who said Scottish culture was unique different from England, should have international scope. Uh, he was a communist, by the way. <laughs> uh, made a big fuss that people noticed, even in Scotland, and usually complained about Because you said in, in the uh, introduction that the, the book, which you thought would be this kind of rag bag of interesting scraps, as you say, uh, as the, it has the unity of a struggle for a confident culture and one shared with good friends, and a lot of the good friends are in the, are in the book. Sir, I agree. <laughs> That's excellent. Um, one of the other things that's in the book is you touch on the importance of childhood writing and reading. I mean, could you say a bit about that, about the importance of childhood education, if you like? Well, I had the luck uh, to have a father and mother who thought, who liked books. One of the only books I still have that has my mother's signature in it is a copy of Bleak House. Um, um, oh, I should say here that my uh, mother spoke with all English. Um, he, Harry Fleming, um, uh, according to marriage certificates and things like that, was a boot clicker in nothing. Um, um, Nottingham was then sometimes called the shoe capital of the world. <laughs> uh, you know, they made shoes and boots and that. <laughs> um, um, I, um, a boot clicker, I discovered, mm -hmm. was not somebody who worked a machine that went clickety-click. Uh, <laughs> it was a term derived from the French word clique. Or clicker. Okay. He was a foreman uh, who went about giving out the bits of leather okay. uh, to folk to see that they were cutting them up and doing it. In other words, he was a foreman. Um, but um, he was a trade unionist. Mm -hmm. And as such, he was put on a blacklist and fired. And therefore he came to Scotland, which is interesting because it shows that the English uh, employers didn't share the same blacklists with the <laughs> Scottish ones. Yeah. But um, um, he got a job with Bean and Duckett's, anyway, making shoes up here. And uh, and that's why my, my mother was... Uh, and her sister, my auntie Annie, were hmm, born in Bridgeton. Let's get back to the main query about libraries, I think. Yes. And in childhood, particularly the you know, importance of childhood re reading and writing and the importance of libraries in your young life. The most important things I ever read and saw 
But before I ever went to school, mm -hmm. there were books in our house. Living Windhorn Street was the one up. <laughs> um, I say my my dad was a reader. He had the complete plays. He was a Fabian socialist. Mm -hmm. He had the complete plays of Bernard Shaw. He had also Shaw's uh, The Perfect Ibsenite. The Tom Johnson's was it our ruling classes? I don't know, I'm afraid. Uh, you know, about, there was a plea for land nationalisation, okay. explaining how the um, um, <laughs> lords and those had got hold of the land. Right. <laughs> Not, as has sometimes been suggested, in 1066, but but steadily over the ages, up and into the 19th century. And was therefore taking the line that they grabbed it because they could, so <laughs> a decent government can take it back. <laughs> uh, uh, which should be the case. Okay. Um, the point was, my parents were literate. Mm -hmm. My mother said that she remembers her dad uh, reading a test of the Turbot of Olds uh, to the family, and she and her mother and her sister being brought to tears. Okay. <laughs> um, this I find unusually interesting. Mm -hmm. It means that in the early days of the 20th century, Hardy was not regarded as the property of the academics, or if you like, the higher bourgeoisie. Uh, no, higher middle class. Okay. Uh, um, astonished by occasionally meeting some friendly people mm -hmm. who regard me as being socially as good as themselves, mm -hmm. but who express astonishment about this fact. <laughs> One of them, when I was a writer in residence at Glasgow University in the cities, 70s, mm -hmm. saying, well, he, he'd been to Oxbury, saying, it's astonishing how somebody of your background knows as much about literature as we do. <laughs> <laughs> I, again, when my first novel, 19, no, Lanark was published, it was an episode in it in which, in a discussion, a childhood discussion, a discussion between two secondary school students at White Hills School, one of them, not my hero, Lanner, mm -hmm. or Bo, or whatever he's called, um, um, one of them says, what bothers him, he doesn't have a main aim in life. He's like the man in a Hemingway story mm -hmm. uh, who has a code, but there's no direction in which to go. The, fr the friend who spoke about that to me was George Swan. I'm there now. But uh, the editor said, now, is it probable uh, that um, someone in a, a Scottish state, state secondary school in the 1950s would have read Hemingway? <laughs> um, <coughs> um, the man who said this naturally assumed mm -hmm. that any, any, any piece of 
doubting that it ever heard was any good, would only be read by folk of his social class and uh, 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 those with lesser incomes would know nothing about it. But surely, you know, the whole role of a library in every town, that was the point, that people had access to all of these books. So were there just people that thought, well, they're just pretty buildings and nobody actually goes into them? <clears throat> I really think that the people who believe that are um, those who belong to what it calls itself the Adam Smith um, something or other in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. um, you, um, sorry, I, I forget the exact name. Mm -hmm. uh, it adopts the name Adam Smith. Um, I think phonally it was Adam Smith. Um, they assume that Adam Smith said that business should govern everything. Mm -hmm. uh, when Adam Smith so indicated he had grave doubts, uh, or, or rather, that he knew that businessmen were, would cheat for their own advantage. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, uh, oh, oh, where am I? Um, um, uh, but the, the Adam Smith organization has indicated that, uh, that nobody needs libraries, they should be turned into Pieces that sell things. Pubs or anything that makes money. Uh, okay. Uh, you've got at the National Library of Scotland, there's an archive of uh, your literary and personal papers. So are you kind of aware of the idea of leaving a legacy? It touches on the book as well, I suppose. Yes. I mean, I'm. I'm I've got, I've got lots of books and things that are diaries. Um, uh, sorry, there are a mixture of diaries and notes about early drafts of work I do. Mm -hmm. And I've um, been giving these, and uh, well, I began sometime in the 1980s. I needed money mm -hmm. uh, to pay for and organise a major exhibition of paintings. Oh, by me! <laughs> and by friends whose work I thought was not properly noticed, uh, to get enough money to buy the place and this and that, I suddenly found that I could sell in diaries and things uh, to the Scottish National Library. Mm -hmm. That gave me the money in order to have these shows. They didn't have... <laughs> uh, sorry. They did not have... They, they did not make us as famous painters as we hoped. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> But um, having found that I could get money, thank God, out of the discussion, the National Library of Scotland, mm -hmm. I have since sold original manuscripts and documents and, and diaries and things yeah, and uh, to, to them ever since and will. Uh -huh. I mean, there are things even like notes made on the back of envelopes and things like that. It's a real uh, wide collection of stuff. Mm. It's true. <laughs> As I realised that <laughs> many of my the books in my shelves, hardly any of them are rarities. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I, I mainly buy books second hand and they're all paperbacks. I mainly so, but, but uh, I have the written and margins things. I'm thinking, mm. <laughs> If I could become an academic in history, as so many writers do, mm. uh, well, uh, some uh, writers do. <laughs> <laughs> some, yeah. It seems a bit of a shame that uh, with uh, email and, and things like that, that you know, letter collecting and, and these 
little bits and pieces probably would die out. I can't imagine people collecting, you know, emails for libraries in the future. I don't know, nobody will. I have no idea. But it depends as well. Mm. Uh, I mean, it depends how they fucking do. Yeah. Um, well, we'll just finish off, Alistair, with uh, what you're working on at the moment, if you don't mind talking a little bit. I don't mind talking at all. I'm, I'm, I'm working in my, I cannot call it, call it a translation of Dante's comedy. It is a paraphrase. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, well, it is a rhymed paraphrase, um, because I feel the urgency of rhyme is very important to it. But I can't read Italian! <laughs> I have five translations that I, I move between. And if, as I hope, people will buy and read my version, they should read it beside a translation. Mm -hmm. I would strongly urge John Chiardi's translation of the 1950s. Okay. Um, because they will see how far I depart from it. Though I do not believe I depart a fraction from Dante's moral message. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, one of the first r r things I read about uh, Dante's Divine Comedy was Will Wilhelm van Loon was an, a Dutch mm -hmm. American who in the 1920s or between the wars wrote books one was the story of mankind, the home of mankind. Okay. And then later, he wrote other ones. Uh, the, the point is, he was trying to convey a, an image of the of the growth, development, history of humanity from early age, earlier ages in. Uh, the whole of mankind was more a geographical survey mm -hmm. of the world's countries in the in the nineteen thirties. Okay. It um, his views came out about the same time as H. G. Wells's study of history. Right. And um, of course, all academic people said, "Well, these amateurs." into a very detailed and complex specialization. There is no doubt that Mr. Wells has written more books than he's ever read. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably right. Uh, but but the, 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 the point is that uh, Wells, and for that man, and, and Hendrik von Loon, the vision of human history, yes, old fashioned now, <laughs> a progressive view of that, that humanity was working to make, to unite and make a happier place for all of us. Mm -hmm. I am astonished, appalled. Mm -hmm. Uh, sometime after the 1960s, at least in Britain and America, mm -hmm. decided that was what a stupid idea. <laughs> We're all right the way we are. <laughs> uh, don't get too cross, Mr. Gray. <laughs> Let me try to get back to what the initial question was. I, uh, I, um, I, be, I believe that 
another threw a knife on his surface uh, and got even more useful information and ideas than I even got from my white old secondary school. Mm -hmm. Though I got a hell of a lot of good ones from there. Mm -hmm. And um, under the welfare state, I got a bursary and admission to the Glasgow School of Art, which well, I'd been, I'd been, I'd been a quite dedicated and serious artist before I got there. Mm -hmm. But when I got there, I got the chance of working even harder at it. Mm -hmm. So the art school basically gave you the opportunity to spend all your hours doing it rather than perhaps just some of them. Yeah, um, yeah. Huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And just to go back to what you're saying, the, the, the Dante book is a uh, Scotch translation, is it, that you've translated the Dante? Uh, it's into my own voice. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, it's into my own voice and dialect. Um, I, I, I think that many English folk will believe my voice and dialect is just a, a slightly different accent. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not think it's different at all. Um, I don't complain about that. Uh, the the um, I'm, I, I I use phrases and occasional words. I'm trying to think of some smur, mm -hmm. uh, a very thin descending Lorraine, uh, which is quite different, I think, from drizzle. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I can't even be bothered thinking about how different my speech is from that of the English. I don't think it is very different, and I don't care. Uh, I, I think it does have a, a Scottish twang to it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, but my Scottish twang isn't something I, I work to emphasise. Yeah, of course. Of course. Well, I think that is the perfect place to leave it. Thanks very much for that answer. Good. So that was roughly half an hour in the company of uh, Alistair Gray and uh, quite a half an hour it was. Um, I kind of wish that uh, I'd left the microphone going. I should explain that I recorded it myself. Um, Ian, Ian uh, couldn't be along to do it, um, hence the kind of slightly dodgy quality. But I wish I'd left it running a bit longer because not long after we finished, he uh, we started talking about our love of um, show tunes and uh, he started singing various things from South Pacific and then he remade me with uh, oh gosh it was a what was the hymn he was singing uh, all things bright and beautiful the full version before uh, dissecting it uh, for me and uh, how it was actually uh, a reactionary uh, piece of writing all those things these are the things you get when you spend time with Alistair uh, it is never a dull moment um, I've been lucky enough to have worked with him on and off over the years on various things and uh, yeah it's the most fun you will have I can promise you that so I hope you enjoyed that um, we enjoyed chatting to him definitely and we'll be back soon with something completely different cheers